This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Hey, what's up? Dear Barney Beekeeper, you have been nominated for Horde Content Creator of the Year. Because this bit takes place back when you actually made videos, please come to Moonglade on January... So there I was, January 18th, 2020, gathered with what was possibly the entire population of Grobulus to celebrate our server's success and community. On this sacred night of festivities, the Horde and the Alliance would lower their weapons of war, craft, and instead raise a tankard of Rumsey Rum Black Label to the Grub Mob. A toast to all those who make our server great. And plus 15 stam for 15 minutes. Nice. The sheer volume of people at this event was unlike anything I had previously experienced. I mean, sure, Orgrimmar on a Tuesday night is pretty busy, but this was something else. Stop casting abilities, please! Both Horde and Alliance together in one tiny village at peak hours on the weekend for a player-organized award ceremony? Pretty fucking cool if you ask me. Transfers to Grubulus are open. The winners for most active Alliance community are... Goof! Sorry about the view, by the way. Originally I was perched on top of that building over there, but uh, turns out that building is cursed. Item 1. In the midst of the event, a random tauren can be seen appearing out of literal thin air behind me. He trades me a lucky charm, then disappears back into the ether. A ghost? Perhaps me from another universe? Item 2. This was the last known sighting of the famous Travels. Seen here ripping his famous catchphrase, it's a Travels world, this hunter of Realm First 60 fame would enjoy the view for a brief moment before disappearing into the crowd. He was never seen from again. Item 3. I was assassinated by unseen assailants shortly after jumping off the building. A ghost? Perhaps me from another universe? I mean, that is something I would do, and I was left on low health and finished with a gun, so... In conclusion, this building is haunted by me from a parallel universe. The winner for most influential content creator on Horde is Barney Beekeeper! Wait, I won? Oh, Barney. Coming through. Hello, yes, excuse me. Yeah, Hi. Barney. Barney! Hey guys, I'm- oh, wait, I'm gonna stop. Hello. Hi. Take me, Barney. Where'd you wanna go? Barney. <laughs> How's it? Barney, uh, yeah. Good job, Twink Boy. Now, I won't lie to you, the recent months had been kinda tough for me, and and a terrible calamity would soon befall the real world, making everything pretty shit. But as I cast my gaze across the crowd of cheering faces, I felt a warmth wash over me, and I found myself to be rejuvenated. Suddenly I felt purpose, inspiration, and responsibility. If I am to be the Horde's greatest content creator, I need to make something that lives up to that mantle. Something epic. And then it happened, as it always does. The unchecked idea gives birth to a goal I know is improbable, but if I know the goal is improbable, then I must know what makes it so. And if I know what makes it so, then I'm already prepared to overcome it. I can do anything I put my mind to, because my mind wouldn't put me to do things I can't. So the only thing holding me back is me. And that's my ninja way. In this moment, I knew what I had to do, what it was going to take to feel worthy of this title. I was going to have to become a Scarab Lord. What even is a Scarab Lord? Why is it so epic? And where the hell have all the videos been, huh? Where have my videos been? Where are the new video, Barney? Barney, what up, dude? Is the vid coming? New video when, Barney B? Hey guys, I'm awake now. Video when? Do you know what the video is coming? Did you know every day I check your channel and cry because no upload? Did you know you can get 68% off a two-year NordVPN plan at nordvpn.com slash Barney64? also get one month free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Make new content. Do you even give video. a damn? Damn about this community. Video. When is the city? When is the video? Do you keep saying there is going to be video, video when? Just call me on my cell phone. Just show the video, my love. But reveal? Wow, seems like you guys really have a lot of questions. Well, let's start with the easy ones. Where have I been? Ah, uh, you know, just. enjoying my favorite game where bosses can just decide to walk out of bounds becoming untargetable just as they were about to die. <laughs> uh, but what if that boss had a move where every time someone died he leveled up making him bigger and stronger? <laughs> Man it would sure suck if he could teleport you to him so you fall under the map and die and get kicked from the game because the game knows you're out of bounds but then you get stuck in an infinite loop of just logging in falling and being kicked. <laughs>
I was also playing a little bit of Animal Crossing. I, I found this strange monument under my house, and there was this skull that whispered to me, boasting ancient forbidden alchemical secrets. How to transmute gold. But that price. That awful price. I did things to those animals. Horrible things. Unspeakable things. Was it even worth it? Yes. Flying under the map in my favorite video game. Did we go through that? Existential Dread. I played through RimWorld again. Probably gonna make this into a, a video though, so I shouldn't really show this. Also, planning to make this entire video series that you're watching right now? You're welcome. It's Scarable, dude. This doesn't happen overnight. Also, all of this. And now we're up to speed. Next question. What is a Scarab Lord? Whilst I'm sure most people who play WoW know what a Scarab Lord is, I'm going to summarize it all anyway, and it starts with the gates of Ankaraj patch. In this patch of World of Warcraft, Blizzard introduced the 20-man raid ruins of Ankaraj and the 40-man raid temple of Ankaraj. However, these raids aren't actually open yet because the gates of Ankaraj are closed. So how do we open the gates? Well, the Ankaraj patch didn't just introduce these two new raids, it also introduced a server-wide event known as the War Effort and a very, 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 very long, notorious questline known as the Scepter questline. The War Effort is a giant cross-faction fetch quest that requires each faction to hand in several thousand materials of varying rarities. Did I say a couple thousand? Sorry, I meant tens of thousands. Once both factions have completed their list, there is a five-day real-time waiting period where the War NPCs will move from their current location to Silithus. And once they arrive in Silithus, the Scarab Gong is able to be rung. This is where the Scepter questline comes in. The Scepter questline is a grueling, grindy, gargantuan task that requires an entire guild support just to stand a chance of completion. And trust me, you're gonna see every single step of this bastard quest, so don't worry if I'm not going into enough detail for you just yet. You will suffer as I have. All you need to know right now is that the scepter quest line rewards you with a scepter. Yeah, no shit. And once the war effort event has concluded and exactly five days have passed, a player can use this scepter to ring the gong outside Ankaraj and open the raid for their server. Following this, there is a 10 hour period where any other scepter bearers can also ring the gong. And why would anyone else want to ring the gong if the raid is already open? Well, that's a tale as old as time. Oh, man. In World of Warcraft, mounts are the status symbol. In some ways, they're more of a representation of your journey than your character even is. You are your mount. If you go to retail right now, you'll notice two things. One, it sucks, and two, everyone just spends all their time collecting mounts from legacy content. Fuck, I mean, I'm guilty of the same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm raiding Old War as I record this audio. <laughs> It's not even a joke! Oh, tab! I'm- I'm- I'm here! Scholars and intellectuals have debated for centuries that the obsession for collecting mounts is the only thing keeping retail afloat, and I would have to agree with them. Mount culture permeates every nook and cranny of this game, and it only grows stronger as each expansion introduces even more mounts. But in a community-driven game that has evolved past the need for community, people aren't going to remember you. They'll only remember your mount. So you better make sure that mount is lit. Proof of your skill, proof of your ability to commit to a grind, proof that you're a lucky son of a bitch, anything is good as long as you're flexing. And this obsession for flexing rare mounts can be traced all the way back to vanilla with the Black Karaji Resonating Crystal. Unquestionably the rarest mount in the game, even still to this day, this mount was the Doombringer, the harbinger of the end times, purely because of how rare and exclusive Blizzard made this mount. You see, this mount can only be obtained by those that ring the Scarab Gong during the 10 hour event I mentioned earlier. And once the event is over, the mount can never be obtained ever again. Never ever. This mount is the ultimate World of Warcraft flex. This mount is what it means to be a Scarab Lord. This mount tells the tale of true gaming legends. Now buckle up for 10 minutes of lore, bitch. Welcome to Silithus, the insect-infested desert of Kalimdor. Eons ago, this desert was still a desert, I guess, but it was home to many bugs. <laughs> Which I guess is still exactly the same. But it was different back then, okay? You know, back when Azeroth used to look like this before Queen Ashara went and blew up the Well of Eternity. Great job. Now these bugs were called the Akir, and the Akir were a sentient race of insectoids who were born from old god poop. Uh, don't believe me? Look it up. Anyway, the Akir just kind of vibed for a couple centuries, not really doing much, uh, not really making any history, not really doing anything that would draw anyone's attention. But then, the Titans attacked from space! The Titans, who are like giant space dudes born from planets, were frolicking through the universe one day when they stumbled upon the planet of Azeroth and realized something was off. Wait, is this planet... Pregnante? And yes, the planet was pregnant, which is good, but there was still something off, which was bad. 
Hey guys, should there be giant eldritch horrors infecting the planet? Yeah, we should probably do something about that. So the Titans swooped in on Azeroth and punched all the old gods really hard. Except for Armin Thul, he kind of went overboard and ripped the old god Yashar straight from the planet, which uh, was a mistake. Oh fuck, oh fuck, what have I done? A deep crevice formed where Yashar was snapped from and Azeroth's lifeblood poured out. Realizing that it's not simple, you can't just kill the old gods. The Titans decided instead to construct giant prisons for the old gods. Prisons that would also function as research centers so they could try to figure out how the hell to save this baby. Now remember the Akir? Turns out the Titans kind of decided to build Cthulhu's prison right on top of where they were living because what are they going to do about it? And the Akir was squished. Couple thousand years later, the Titans are off in another universe doing Titan stuff. But don't worry, they built some stone robots to run these prisons. What could go wrong? Now that the land isn't swarming with old gods and isn't yet swarming with elves or humans, it's a pretty good day to be a troll. This is the height of the troll empire, the golden arc of troll kind. They're everywhere and they run this shit. The Jakari tribe probably should have kept it down around Old War though, because they kind of woke up old god yogg Saron's most dedicated servant, uh, a dude called Kithix. And guess what? He's pissed. Swearing vengeance against the trolls for waking him up, Kithix used his mind magic to scan the planet for insecure beings ripe for manipulation. And he found what he was looking for. Remember the Akir from earlier? Turns out they're not all dead. They're just underground and really sad about it. The perfect targets. And so he began whispering to them. After decades of whispering, the job was done. The small tribe of insectoids had reproduced into an army, and Kithix was ready to go to war with the trolls. Only he definitely wasn't ready to go to war with the trolls, because he actually got his ass handed to him, like, the same day, and then Kithix, he just fucking died. Fuck this, said some of the Akir, we're just gonna go back underground. And then they ran away to the north to create the subterranean kingdom of Asjol Narun. The rest of the Akir, who definitely didn't want to go back underground, decided, no, it's time to rise up and take back our land. Land. They ransacked the prison of Cthulhu and started building an insect kingdom inside it. It's hard to say whether or not the Akir knew that there was an old god unconscious in the basement, but what we do know is that Cthulhu's latent energies started transforming the Akir, and before long they had become an entirely new race, the Karaji. They named their old god prison Hive Kingdom and Karaj, and then they just fell asleep for like a thousand years. A thousand years later. Azeroth looks a little different now, because Queen Ashara... Yeah. Anyway, Silithus is now a night elf territory because the druids want to make Silithus into a lush green forest and plant a big tree there and call it Dordrasil. Oh, also, Cthulhu just woke up. Wake up, bugs. Go do bug stuff. And so all the bugs woke up and flooded Silithus and it sucked. Hey, these bugs are killing us, the night elf said to the archdruid. And the archdruid was like, don't worry, guys. My son got this. And his son was like, wait, what? And then his son died, because he definitely didn't got this. No, the archdruid cried. My son is dead. I'm too depressed to war. And so the bugs pushed the night elves out of Silithus into Ungoro and made three hives, here, here, and here. Then the bugs pushed the night elves out of Ungoro into Tenaris and made a hive here. And then the bugs pushed into Tenaris and made two hives here and here. And by this point, the night elves were like, hey, these bugs are still killing us. Do something, archdruid. And the archdruid was like, don't worry, guys. The bronze drakes got this. And the bronze drakes were like, wait, what? No, we don't care about this. Knock, knock. It's the Karaji army with huge bugs with swords. Sword bugs. Open the caverns of time. Stop having them be closed. No? Now that the bugs had tried to move on his territory, Anachronos was pangry. So pangry. He called up all his dragon friends to come help him nuke the bugs and push them back into Ankaraj. One by one, the drakes used their signature forbidden jutsus to thin the Karaji numbers. And then Anachronos, when the archdruid channeled their energies to create a giant gate and sealed Ankaraj shut forever. TM. With his fire breath, Anachronos melted down the dead Anubisath into obsidian, and with it he formed a sacred gong. He then produced three ultra-rare gems, and together with the leftover obsidian, he fashioned a scepter. Should you ever need to reopen these gates, take this scepter and ring the gong. The archdruid received the scepter, turned to Anachronos, and said, What? I'm not going in there? Ever! And then he smashed the scepter into little pieces, and Anachronos was like, Hey? Dick? And then he flew off. Present day. Turns out the bugs have realized, wait, this is a wall. We can just climb over it. And some of us have wings. Like, what are we doing? So now Silithus is being swarmed again, and we need to open these gates to take the fight to the source. Source. And unlike the bugs, we can't just climb over the wall. So if we're going to open these gates, we need to rebuild the Scepter of the Shifting Sands. And to do that, we're going to need help. Lots of help. Please, please wish me luck. 
Welcome to day one of patch 1.13.5. Turns out you can just climb over the wall. Yeah, we, we figured this out in like 20 minutes, so... that That's the end of the video series, thank you for- Okay, it turns out the raids don't actually work until the gates are open. Uh, that sucks. Blocked out of content? Thanks a lot, Blizzard. Man, the last time I was blocked out of content like this was when I moved back to the UK and could no longer watch US Netflix. You know, the good one. Hey, stop listening to my thoughts. That's fucked up. I could have been thinking about anything. If only there was a way I could bypass region block so I could watch The Office on Netflix instead of friends. They have friends in the UK. Friends? Friends? This shit sucks. Okay, I guess uh, now you know I don't like friends. So uh, <laughs> we, can, we gonna stay out of my head now? Thanks. But seriously, if anyone knows how to bypass region blocks, uh, that would be very helpful for me personally. I guess we'll never know. Yeah, call me when uh, they play the one with the funny joke. <laughs> this is laughter inside my own head. Welcome to Scenario Hole, the final outpost. Here we can find Baristolf of the Shifting Sands. Hey, what's up? I'm Baristolf of the Shifting Sands. All you need to know about this guy is that he was brought back to life by Anachronos with magic sand, and now his eternal service is that he has to stand here and just watch forever. And if you think that sounds miserable, I take no pleasure in telling you that his fate gets so much worse. Like right now, I'm supposed to be picking my quest up from him. Uh, you may have noticed he's not fucking here. Ah, we'll get to that later. Luckily for me, another Scarab Lord target in my guild had picked up the quest earlier and was able to share it. Oh, right, Scarab Lord targets, I should probably tell you about that. Getting Scarab Lord requires a lot of people with a lot of time. So many people and so much time that even large guilds will usually opt to grind for just the one Scarab Lord. And for the most part, that was the case on Grobulus. One guild, one Scarab Lord target. However, my guild, final, final boss, boss, let's just say we had bigger plans. Ask anybody on Grobulus what they think of Final Boss, and the answer will probably vary. To some, they're just your average sweaty raiding guild. Final Boss are sweaty nerds. They're try hard, lol. I went to a dungeon with some Final Boss members, and they were all so geared that I ended up with all the loot. It was awesome, made me forget about my terrible home life. To others, Final Boss are the living embodiment of everything that is wrong with my classic experience. The most repugnant server villains you ever did see. The bad guys. Final boss are toxic trash. I hate them. Okie dokie spits on the ground. I heard you have to go fully world buff to every raid or they kick you. Final boss may have every realm first, but they will never have. Live. Perfect. As you can see, we have quite the reputation. And given that this is a roleplay server, it wouldn't be very in character of us to slack during this event. Why stop at one Scarab Lord when you can have two? Oh my god. But wait. Why stop at two Scarab Lords when you can have three? No. No. But wait. And, and watch what I do right here. Why stop at three Scarab Lords when you could just not stop at all? What? That's crazy. This is my guild Scarab Lord target list. If this looks long and ridiculous to you, that's because it is. There is absolutely no way everyone on this list is getting Scarab Lord, but when the goal is to get as many as possible, there's nothing wrong with overshotting the list. And who's that all the way at the bottom of the list? <laughs> it's me! <laughs> uh, it's not looking good. But you guys know me, I'm just here for the experience. And the mischief. I've got a lot of new tricks up my sleeve. I've been dying to try. <laughs> it's a it's a pun. Uh, you'll get it later. Is it likely I'm going to get Scarab Lord? No, not even a little bit. But I want to see how far I can get nonetheless. After all, this event only happens once. And what kind of gamer would I be if I didn't give it my best shot? Also, I swore to myself that I would make a good video out of this event because you know I make videos allegedly. <laughs> Right now, Baristolf needs us to check if Anachronos and his crew are home. He'd do it himself, but he's bound to this location by blood. Or I guess in this case, sand? Now your average troglodyte moron would pick up this quest and then take the five minute flight path to Tenaris and then walk the five minute trek to Anachronos. Luckily for you, you've entered the real gaming zone. Wow, the power of planet. It's just that easy. So now we're in Tenaris outside the caverns of time, or more accurately, inside a wall outside the caverns of time. Don't worry about it. Our current mission objective, locate Anachronos and his friends. God, I hope we make it. But yeah, not really much to say about this quest. I just had to walk 
forward. So that's that, really. Uh, and then I waited for my summon back to Cenarian Hold. A warrior attacked me on low health, which I don't want. I wasn't even trying to fight. Look, I blinded him. I was trying to run away and take my summon. But then I saw his last stand run out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, like you take the summon without killing the guy on one health. Anyway, I took the summon back to Cenarian Hold and went to hand in the quest to Barristol. The observative among you will, of course, notice um, he's still not fucking here. He's up, 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 he's up. <laughs> yeah, it turns out if you flag yourself as at war with the Cenarian Hold, you can just kill Baristol. Well, that's good game design. Naturally, where there's the potential for griefing, you will usually find a griefer. But in this case, we weren't so lucky for there to be only one. Enter Epi the Scarab Lord. No one knows who these anonymous agents of chaos were, where they came from, or even what their motive was. The identity of these fiends is still a heated point of contention today, with fingers being pointed aimlessly in every witch direction at every witch guild, backed up by an underwhelming amount of circumstantial evidence. Intellectuals expect the identity of the Epi for Scarab Lord members to stay an unsolved grobulous mystery until the end of time. But we don't need to know their identities or to understand their motives to understand their goal, because their goal was pretty fucking clear. Baristolf must die. So here's what happened. The Griefers would revive and kill Baristolf, then people would retaliate and kill the Griefers. Ten minutes later, Baristolf would respawn and the Griefers would revive and kill Baristolf. Rinse and repeat. But not only was Baristolf being griefed, no, that would make things too simple. People were also openly PvPing in the streets knowing there was too much going on for the guards to do anything about it. Ah, but naturally defending yourself would get you immediately killed by those guards. <laughs> oh, also I have a raid at 11 because for the next part of the quest I have to kill a guy in Blackwing Lair and bring his head to Baristol, so uh, <laughs> really hope I can pick that quest up sometime soon. <laughs> He's up. No! no! Server lag. <laughs> Let me speak to him, please, please, bro. Barney, you get it? That's your time. Nope, I'm fucking dead. Haha. -ha. I'd love to see a video of this from your perspective. It's not very interesting. I gotta completely be. <laughs> yes. That was the worst shit I've ever done. <laughs> oh, how naive I was back then. Little did I know I'd come to long for those days of waiting two hours to pick up a quest. But as for right now, I'm kind of late for that raid. Yes, 39 other people were waiting for me whilst this fuckery was going on. Thanks, Epi for Scarab Lord. I honestly wasn't expecting the level of griefing to be this high right off the bat, but as a wise man once said, If you didn't Wait. expect this to happen, I don't know what world you're living in. Welcome to Blackwing Lair in the dark recesses of the mountain's peak, Nefarian. The eldest son of Deathwing conducts some of his most awful experimentation, controlling mighty beings like puppets and combining the eggs of different dragon flights with horrific results. Should he prove successful, even darker pursuits rest on the horizon. But we didn't come here for another lore tangent. Even the quest doesn't have a lore reason as to why we're here to kill Broodlord Lashlayer specifically, we just have to do it to prove our worth. You'd think if that was the case, they'd have us collect the Head of Firemore, you know, the actual hardest encounter in the raid. Implying classic is hard. Now this raid I'm in isn't my normal weekly raiding team. With so many Scarab Lord targets and only five-ish raiding teams, we can only clear Blackwing Lair five times a week. And with no way of knowing just how fast the war effort might complete, those five raids might be the only heads that can go towards Scarab Lords. Some servers were predicted to, and did, finish their war effort hand-ins on day one. And whilst Grobulus wasn't predicted to finish that fast, one thing was for certain. If you want a serious chance at Scarab Lord, you need to get a Broodlord head on your first weekly lockout. But when when you're last on the list in a situation where not even your guild has enough raids to go around, you have to get creative. So I joined a GDKP. So what's a GDKP? A GDKP is essentially a pug ran by a trusted member of the community. They need to be trusted because in a GDKP, all the loot is bid on with gold. Once the raid is complete, the raid will move to a location and bid on all the items that dropped. Once all the items have been auctioned off, the money is then totaled and divided equally amongst the raiders. You make a nice long queue and then one by one, everyone is traded their share. It's a pretty good system for all those involved. People can join just to make money, people can join to try and buy gear, people can join just to have fun and raid for fun. People raid for fun? Wait, people play this game for fun? On Grobulus, we have many GDKPs. On Horde side only, by the way. The Alliance don't know what the fuck they're doing, and this isn't even like a haha, Alliance suck meme. Like, they actually don't have GDKPs, and they also outnumber us, so it doesn't even make sense. Like, what are you guys doing? This post made by the Horde Grobulus gang. Step it up, Alliance. 
It's kind of sad. But as I was saying, on Horde side Grubulus, we got GDKPs running every single fucking day of the week. You can't even look at the trade chat without having copy pasta forced down your throat. Delicious. So naturally, in the weeks leading up to the event, I fished around all the GDKPs messaging the various organizers to know what the going rate would be for a Broodlord head, but unfortunately for me, the head was either sold, not for sale, or just a bit too pricey for a humble Lucky Charm salesman such as myself. Once upon a time, I prided myself knowing that everything I had I worked for, but uh, honestly, it's kind of getting old, because rogues don't really have good money-making farms, and with the Great Arcanite Crash of 2020, I'm starting to see that Asmongold... Asmongold had it right the whole time, abusing clout for in-game currency truly is best in slot. Please send me gold. It's not even a bit. I'm not even gonna send Lucky Charms anymore. I just want gold. Just give me <laughs> So with no Broodlord heads available, and with all my friends either belonging to my guild or guilds that were going for Scarab Lords of their own, I had nowhere left to turn. No other options. It looks like I had run out of luck. Sight, bitch! I rub my lucky charm and put that thing into overdrive, starting a chain of catastrophic timeline-altering events. Temporal sickness is a very real thing. I haven't felt quite like myself since I manifested this timeline, but it was worth it, because in this timeline, Virgin's weekly GDKP actually doesn't have a Broodlord head target. In this timeline, Bon Hoovy is too put off by the Scarab Lord grind to want it. So in this timeline, the Broodlord head goes to me. And because I re-rolled timelines until I made it this way, in this timeline, I don't even have to pay for it. God, I'm fucking good. Anyway, the rest of this raid was a pretty standard ordeal. We finished in about 90 minutes with no wipes, which is pretty damn good for a pug. If you came for dungeon drama, I'm afraid I've let you down. The best I can do is let this clip play out wherein I go 12 seconds without getting healed and die. I hope this helps. After we killed Nefarian, we ported to Orgrimmar to auction off the loot. Usually this is done in the Valley of Spirits, but instead we opted to jump out of bounds and do some of the auctions underneath Orgrimmar. T -t 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 Ten minutes later... Multiple people were reported to have been bleeding from the eyes due to the aggressively orange background, so we moved to do the rest of the auctions behind the Ragefire Chasm portal. After the loot was auctioned off, I received my split of 379 gold wow. and took the flight path back to Cenarian Hold. All things considered, I was making pretty good progress. I had secured my brutal Head, I had doubled my gold, my roommates cooked me dinner, and I had a big bag of wheat, water, and other legal substances. Needless to say, I was overcome with optimism. That was until I flew into Cenarian Hold and saw the swarming mass of people and realized, oh no, I have to hand this head into Baristol, and he's still being griefed. <laughs> no, 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 no! For two more agonizing hours, I had to watch Baristol spawn, live, and die over and over. Over. Epi for Scarab Lord had at this point been griefing Baristol for six hours and morale was at an all-time low. The Chaos Insurgents had succeeded in wearing everybody down, and the people cried out for relief, for an end to their misery. I reached across my desk and lightly caressed my framed image of Jeff Kaplan and closed my eyes. Please, Jeff. Please help us. Hear my prayer. Do something. Do anything. I opened my eyes. Baristolth respawned, but I was late. I spammed revive and mashed my interact macro. The window opened, I clicked my quest, I handed it in, and I- YES! YES! It's funny! As you can hear, I was quite ecstatic. But not as ecstatic as Baristolth, because as you might have noticed, um, he's still fucking here. Not dying, not dead, not under attack, but alive, and standing proud, ready to hand out quests. And you wanna know why? Because after six long, awful, harrowing hours, Blizzard had finally taken notice of us peasants and reached out their giant frosty hand and, and, and made Baristolth invincible. No changes, by the way. And just like that, the evil was vanquished. Epi for Scarab Lord was no more. Now let me tell you about the next part of the quest. To rebuild the Scepter of the Shifting Sands, we need to locate the three gems I spoke about earlier. Unfortunately for us, we have no idea where any of them are, and the only person that does, uh, hates us. So naturally, Anachronos isn't gonna be telling us a damn thing. However, there's one thing Anachronos hates even more than us. Those damn bugs! Baristolth reckons if we kill enough bugs and provide proof, Anachronos might yet still be swayed. So he brands us with the Mark of Nosdormu, and asks us to kill bugs in Silithus to improve our shoddy reputation with the Bronze Dragonflight. I don't know what I did personally to be hated by these bronze dragons, but I'm not. 
as an agent of Nosdormu, anytime I kill a bug from one of the three hives or the spire outside Cenarian Hold, I will be able to loot between one and four Silithid Carapace fragments. Once I have 200 fragments, I can hand them into Barristolf to improve my reputation with Anachronos. But wait, my reputation's really bad. How many times am I gonna have to do this quest? He will also give me a proxy of Nosdormu, an item that lets me deputize other people so they too can collect fragments without having to do all the steps that led up to this point in the quest. Speaking of proxies and good reputation, NordVPN.com slash Barney64. Alert, C cyber deal. Save 68% off a two year plan and also get a free uh, month and also get a free gift on top. Cyber deal. I literally paid my taxes using NordVPN because the state of Michigan for some reason doesn't accept payments from IP addresses outside the USA and I'm in the UK. C Hello? I just want to- Cyber deal. This service stopped me from accidentally committing tax evasion. So that's- Pretty good. NordVPN.com slash Barney64. Now with the ability to loot carapace fragments from the bugs, I set off to Hive Zora where my guild were currently stationed. The system we had going at this point was pretty simple. All fragments farmed were to go towards the current Scarab Lord target, which at this point was Typo, and slowly over time he would deputize other people in the raid as he got fragments. If you were currently one of the few people able to make the fragments drop, you were given a raid mark so people knew to let you hit mobs at least once so the fragments would actually drop. For the purpose of this video, I would be allowed to keep my first 200 fragments for myself just to serve as a benchmark for how long it would take to farm that many. I'd say under normal circumstances a solo player could probably farm about 100 fragments in about an hour. But we weren't the only ones here. With Barristolf now invincible there was no longer an arbitrary roadblock holding people back and so pretty much every single guild going for Scarab Lord on the server began pouring into the hives at the same time. The floodgates had been opened. The great bug farming had begun.